on the build-up to the deployment, we constantly receiving videos and lectures that were just guided for dehumanization, filled with racial slurs, uh, haji, raghead, etc. And um, these videos that were shown were completely grotesque. Um, seriously, seeing a rocket shot in half with a M240 machine gun. Just literally shot in half. You see the blood and guts spilling all over the show. And the, the room, it would become filled with energetic, oorah, we're going to go kill those ragheads from most of the Marines in the room. And it was completely so energetic, it was pretty unbearable. And then all the instructors, they would be constantly racial slurs everywhere. It was like, March 4th of 2004, we crossed the line of departure to move northwestward through Iraq and to our destination, a little bit west of the city of Arupa. And within the first week of there, there was already the explosions going on, uh, EOD blowing up bombs on the side of the road. And uh, we went to this town on a, what we call Cordon Knox. We didn't call them Cordon Searches, we call them Cordon Knox. So it would be like a friendly, inviting, hey, we'll come out and knock on your door, and you'll just let us right in. That's how we were taught, but it ends up just being cordon bars away into the room. And uh, ransacking people's houses, pulling people out of the buildings, uh, handcuffing them, putting sandbags over their heads. Whether they were innocent or guilty, n nobody really knew. We would go into the cities and do completely opposite our mission. And then some events happened on uh, March 31st, 2004. Uh, pretty famous worldwide news media. Four, U four U.S. contractors uh, were killed in Fallujah. Um, they were dragged behind. And uh, two of them were hanging from the Fallujah Bridge. And on October 1st, we received our marching orders. And most of the entire division and most of the troops in the area were ordered to go to Fallujah to participate in Operation Vigilant Resolve. And uh, the initial seize of the siege of Fallujah were, within that month, over 130 service members died. And on that siege, reportedly, there were over 600 Iraqis that died, and over half of them were non-combatants. And uh, in the news medias, you'd see terms like, with precision guided missiles and uh, terrorists having an acute willingness to die. And that's one of the events, the March 31st events, that really shaped the loosening of our rules of engagement. Um, starting, they were, pretty they were pretty strict. And with hostile intent, positive identification, hostile act, the difference between that. But after these events, and in beginning in April when we went to Fallujah, the rules of engagement became very loose. And we were, if we wanted to, we could shoot somebody that was carrying a shovel. We could shoot somebody with a cell phone because somehow they remote, remote control detonate their bombs. So any act, the whole, it became, the line became very blurry about what hostile act and hostile intent was. Everything just became hostile act. If you feel threatened, pull the trigger. Shoot them. Shoot them dead. So that was the first instance of where our rules of engagement became very loose. And then I was the motor transport operator, so I ended up becoming a heavy machine gunner most of the time while I was there. I drove every now and then. But then, so being that, we were in charge of transporting detainees that were taken from the town whether they get guilty or not, I don't know. And I don't know where they went. We did, they just went to regiment. So, again, sandbags over the head. That's when we could still sandbag people. Shortly in the middle of deployment, they, they cut that off. But uh, with the detainees, a lot of times they're called detainees. You really can't call them prisoner wars because uh, that gives them rights. So they get called detainees. They get, can be held from whatever amount of time. And I've personally witnessed uh, detainees being butt-stroked in the face with the rifle butts, uh, knocking out teeth. I've seen, seen them thrown out of the backs of the trucks. And the 
daytime, some some of the guards they would uh, it was it was a game pretty much. They would in the middle of the sun. This is April. It's very hot. Uh, in the middle of the day, deprive them, deprive the detainees of water. But then in the middle of the night, keep them up all night and just go up, make them force just force feed them water just so they would piss themselves. And some Marines thought that was pretty funny. I was. I was at a position at a time where I could get out of it, but I didn't say anything, so I'm, I'm just as guilty for allowing it happen as anybody else that, that participated in it. June 2004, there were four U.S. Marine Corps snipers that were killed. Uh, it was really weird because there was only one, one trained sniper, and then there were three grunts with them. They were killed on a rooftop, all four of them. They really don't know how it happened, but they the end of the report, they just blamed the one trained sniper, even though there was a complete team. Somebody had to take responsibility, and he was the highest rank of corporal at the time. So he ended up getting the blame for that one. And that was another instance that really loosened our rules of engagement each more, made them even more blurry. It's just like everything is hostile act. Everything, if you feel unsafe, if you feel insecure, defend yourself, even if they are openly walk, if they are openly walking around with a weapon, or if they have a weapon, even though it's within the constitution of the Rockies, they are allowed to have a weapon. So we would continue to do our court and Knox, uh, retrieve all these weapons, and take these, they were automatically t detainees, and take them to the next place. And then um, in the middle of it, it was August. It was towards the end of the deployment. I was really starting to have a lot of problems uh, mentally. And then just because explosions, the combat, the combat experience, the uh, uh, witness to these devastating acts to humankind, I really started to have a lot of problems. And I didn't, I was, I was being the tough Marine. I was like, yeah, John. People ask me, John, you all right? I was like, yeah, I'm cool. Let's go drink some beers. And uh, self-medication for probably about the next six months. And uh, in June of 2005, uh, I really had to sit myself down and ask myself a really serious question. John, you're in trouble. Um, do you, are you going to finish your enlistment? Because my enlistment was done in less than three months in October 2005. It's like, but I was so far gone, it was the question of John, you know the military is not your life, and it's not going to be your life. And you're going down the wrong way, down a destructive path. John, you really need to save yourself. So at the time, I made the decision to save myself. And uh, I went AWOL from the, from the Marines for 11 months. And I uh, met with a lady actually right here in, in town. I, was, I called her up one day, and uh, within two days, I was in her office for therapy. And um, I really left because through the military, I would just be on standby, standby. I went into the BAS or uh, the sick call. I had appointments up with a division counselor. And, but it was just waiting, 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 waiting. And that's where the decision came. It's like, you really need to go save yourself. So then, um, so then I left, and then I sought my own help. I decided to help myself out. And later on in, in the middle of 2006, I returned to Quantico, Virginia. I uh, turned myself, surrendered back to military control voluntarily. And uh, I was there for a month and a half and I ended up being separated with an honorable discharge because I had such a, such sound evidence to the military lack of lack of care so that I uh, end up they just send me on my way with uh, with uh, able to receive full benefits so and now I'm here going to the UW Oshkosh and working on a disability claim right now and it's been I just started it because I knew I wouldn't follow it up and that's how the story came about from deployment to loosening rules of uh, engagement to witnessing the destructive acts of mankind and to where I am today. Thank you.